Thanks very much. We're just glad Coach didn't get splinters. Welcome to College Football on ESPN, presented by Cars.com. And we welcome you to Columbia, South Carolina, an SEC matchup between the Florida Gators and the Gamecocks of South Carolina. Good afternoon, everybody. Mike Patrick, Ed Cunningham. It's great to have you with us. Florida has already qualified for the SEC championship game, but they have designs on bigger things. South Carolina, meanwhile, still trying to become bowl eligible, and they'll have to do it without the head ball coach. Yeah, Steve Spurrier resigned a few weeks ago, and Sean Elliott, who was the offensive line coach, took over. And what a breath of fresh air it's been here. The head ball coach said a new voice was needed, and this guy has a great voice. He is so positive. They've changed the offense, more option, more runs. Former offensive line coach now touching all of the team, and you can see the re energy, uh, energy of this team growing even through two tough losses. And they've handed the reins over to Perry Orth, a former walk-on, not the typical Spurrier-type quarterback, a good arm, but he also can run it. You're going to see a lot more option today. And, oh, by the way, as good as this team has played, they haven't played at home in a while. They've played right. on the road. First game at home. I don't know that this is an upset as South Carolina pulls this one out. A lot of energy for them. South Carolina won the toss. They have deferred. So Landon Ard will kick it away. Two-thirds of his kicks have gone into the end zone. Brandon Powell deep to receive, standing a yard deep, averaging 21.6 yards a return this year. And he'll let it go. They'll start it to 25. We check in with Dr. Jerry Punch. Thanks, Mike. Folks, the South Carolina roots run deep for interim head coach Sean Elliott, who grew up in nearby Camden as a huge Gamecock fan. Heck, his brother went to school here. His dad was a highway patrolman who worked security here. And his high school team, the Camden Bulldogs, won a state championship on this very field in 1990. Now, when you talk to them, his energy and motions are infectious. We see it on the practice field. You saw it in the games the last two weeks at Tennessee and A&M. Diehard Gamecock fans are thrilled at what he has done. Many believe a resume win today may be all it takes to remove the word interim from his title. Mike? Jerry, thanks very much. A lot of people rooting for him. And he has done a wonderful job. Slow starts for South Carolina all season. Let's see if a rare home game helps them out. Treon Harris, empty backfield, goes out to Antonio Galloway. Kid with just tremendous ability. Harris took over the Gator offense when Will Greer was suspended mid-October. The sophomore has completed 55% of his passes, thrown for more than 850 yards, five touchdowns, just one pick, and he also can get some yards on the ground. He admitted that, you know, he was in a different offense last year when he started six games as a freshman under Will Muschamp. Admitted that uh, he was a little big lights against LSU. He started to settle in a bit. Taylor. Swallowed up by T.J. Holloman, the middle linebacker. But it should be enough for a first down. And Harris and Greer had kind of gone back and forth a bit. They thought of them as kind of co-quarterbacks coming into the season, but then Greer had kind of separated himself. Greer had a fantastic game against Ole Miss, four touchdowns, but then uh, was suspended by the NCAA for performance-enhancing drugs. A 12-month suspension that they are now appealing, but Harris has taken over, and below him, it gets really thin. Josh Grady now, the backup quarterback, a transfer from Vanderbilt who played mostly wide receiver there. Blitz coming. Trying to get away from pressure, and we'll just throw it away. Jake McGee was in the area, so they won't call him for intentional grounding, but Treon Harris was under complete assault as Marcavius Lewis the junior college transfer, and to some people, the number one Juco prospect in the country was putting pressure on the quarterback. McElwain knows a thing or two about transfers because when he got here, there was a lot of defensive players. Florida, one of the best defenses in the country under Muschamp and still, but the cupboards were pretty bare offensively. They got a transfer offensive tackle. As I mentioned, they're down to a transfer, mostly wide receiver quarterback from Vanderbilt as the backup. Kelvin Taylor off right tackle. Gets a couple, and that's all. Gerald Dixon, Jr., number 92. And uh, this is what uh, Florida offensively, they've had some struggles up front on the offensive line, but they're trying to get Kelvin Taylor 
course, whose father Fred was a star here in the NFL. Off the edge, McElwain, a run first offensive coordinator from all of his time, especially under Nick Saban while he was at Alabama. DeAndre Goolsby, number 30, checks in as a tight end, and they put him in the slot. Harris with time, floats it for the sideline, tried to fit it in there to Demarcus Robinson, but he was double covered, and the Gators will have to kick it away. Well, that ball floated on Harris. He, he's good on the short intermediate throw. Some of the longer throws are where his accuracy is not spot on. This ball floated forever. For a second there, Demarcus Robinson, who had a nice game last week against Vanderbilt, albeit, albeit he had a fumble late in the game, but that ball just hung forever on Harris. you got to drill that a little tighter. Johnny Townsend to kick to Farrell Cooper, the multi-talented star for South Carolina. Takes it on the hop, only gets a yard or two on the return out to the 28-yard line. Kick of 42 yards. The South Carolina quarterback is Perry Orth, one of three to start for the Gamecocks this season. The junior hasn't exactly been lighting it up, completing only 54% of his passes, six interceptions to go along with seven touchdowns. But he has gotten better, it seems, every week. And if you have not seen South Carolina play since Steve Spurrier left, it's a totally, not totally different offense, but they have added a ton of different types of options. And this is good news for Florida. That is John Bullard, one of the best defensive tackles in the country who was questionable with an arm injury out for the first snap. South Carolina wearing all black will be penalized, or at least there's a flag down on the first play. Prior to the snap, false start, 76, offense, five-yard penalty, still first down. Mike Matulis called for it. Let's take a look at today's impact players brought to you by Jared, the Galleria of Jewelry. Well, you mentioned Farrow Cooper. He'll throw it. He'll run it. He'll be everywhere. Brandon Wilds, they, they want to get him 17 or more carries. That's what he's been running for the last three games, establishing the power run more. Alex McAllister off the edge, getting better as a run defender, but awfully good as a pass rusher. And Vernon Hargraves, one of the best one or two corners that we've seen. We saw Mackenzie Alexander at Clemson, a very good one, but Hargrave's a guy who can erase one side of the field for this Florida defense. Four-man rush, plenty of time. And both quarterbacks having trouble early with accuracy issues. Yeah, if you're going to throw that on the sideline, you can't be uh, over by the Gatorade. It's got to be in the field of play. And Orth, who took over earlier in the year, the starter was Connor Mitch. So Florida has had its, or excuse me, South Carolina has had its issues at quarterback as well. Mitch was hurt with a separated shoulder and a badly uh, bruised hip. Had to be hospitalized. And Lorenzo Nunez, a true freshman who's more of a runner, sometimes comes in and play and has started. Cooper takes a wildcat snap. Farrell Cooper out to the 36-yard line. That's where they'll mark it. It'll be a couple of <laughs> yards shy, and as Ed said, he can do anything. Jim McElwain, the head coach of Florida, said this guy might be the best player in our league. Watch this move here. Whoop. Great block. Good finish there of the block up front by the left tackle shell. But what a cut and what acceleration. Florida offside. 94, Brian Cox, Jr., his dad, a great player in his own right, now an assistant Offside, coach in the NFL. On the defense, number 94. Five-yard penalty results in the first down. Brian Cox Sr. was a frightening man to play against. Oh, he was wonderful. I played wasn't against he? him multiple times. He didn't say much, <laughs> but the energy he had was just a bit frightening. And this guy is starting to play a little more on offense, has given them good energy. A lot of defensive lineman issues for Florida coming into this game. Jordan Sherritt, a very promising young lineman, will not play in the first half after being ejected for targeting in the second half against Vanderbilt last week. Orth with Wilds as his running back. Wilds will get the carry. Picks up a couple of yards before Bullard stops him. Pro Football Weekly said that Bullard was the number one run stopper in college football and is a Sure, high draft choice. And he got injured, played very well against Vanderbilt. At times, he has been unblockable this year, but he had an arm injury, did not practice much. He is from Shelby, North Carolina, not far from here. So we were told he was going to do everything he could to try to play. Orth flushed. Doesn't slide. Head first dive out to 
just across the 45-yard line as the pocket collapsed. Well, let's watch why the pocket collapsed. This guy has some power. Look at the hands inside on the lineman. He's got to be careful with that hand up to the face there at the end. It was okay, and there's a Florida player down. That's not a good good news with Alex McAllister down. More issues up front, but that's uh, that's why this guy is so important to this Gators defense is how powerful he can be in the middle. And that's last week's SEC Defensive Player of the Week who is down. We'll check on him when we come back. You're watching the SEC on ESPN. Nothing, nothing, early first quarter, and Alex McAllister walked ever so slowly off the field and is being ten tended to on the Gator sideline. And for Sean Elliott, a offensive line coach by trade, he was at Appalachian State, came here to the SEC five years ago. Interim head coach now changing the offense so that third and five used to be a throw down and you knew it every time. Now this could be an option run with this new wrinkle offense. Quick out, and that is quite a story. The man who made that catch, Hayden Hurst, a 6'5", 252-pound, 23-year-old freshman who is a walk-on and has elite skills. He was a pitcher and first baseman in the Pittsburgh Pirates organization. He was friends with Perry Orth. Orth texted him and said, hey, you should come walk on and play football. They tried him at tight end. They realized, well, he doesn't like the block. He used to be a pitcher. But he's got 4-5 speed, great hands, and apparently a great arm, too, which sounded like we may see later today. Fake the double reverse, and they will lose multiple yardages. C.C. Jefferson comes over to make the tackle. A loss of six. Well, everyone playing South Carolina needs to know a lot of this is coming at them. And Florida talked about all week. Jeff Collins, the first-year defensive coordinator. They had Lorenzo Nunez, mm, yeah. one of the quarterbacks, taking the handoff. He wanted to throw it. And looks like he may have uh, injured himself. Good recognition by Jefferson, though. True freshman. Didn't panic. Florida comes through the four-man rush. Great throw, a better catch, a huge hit from Nick Washington. But the ball did not come loose as Perry Orth just drilled it in there. Good job by Matrick Belton bringing this in. Orth a little bit late. And a good hit by the safety coming over, not leading with the head. He turned his shoulder, so a good clean shoulder hit. But uh, Belton did seem to wave himself off after the catch. Matrick Belton, 6'4", went up, knew the hit was coming. Got it anyway. And then Orth ran into trouble as he tries to scramble. Cox and Morris in the middle linebacker combined <laughs> to sandwich him at the 45. Antonio Morrison exploded up on the quarterback on that run. You don't. You didn't see many quarterback runs when Spurrier was the coach, but now with G.A. Mangus taking over as the offensive coordinator, but Morrison, a guy who had a gruesome knee injury in the bowl game, was maybe going to sit this year out and just get ready for the NFL draft next year, but worked his way back, and they said was at maybe faster speed first game when they expected him back maybe midseason this year. Fair catch, made it to 12. 32-yard punt, no return, no score, early first quarter. It's presented by Cars.com. All drive, no drama. And in part by Chick-fil-A. We didn't invent the chicken, just the chicken sandwich. Some of the brave men and women around the world sporting their SEC school colors. This is the week that we honor America's heroes who have served and are currently serving in our nation's armed forces. Jerry Punch with an update on a Ninja Gator. Yeah, Alex McAllister had it, helped off the field. They've examined his right knee and now right ankle. Dr. Michael Moser, good news. It looks like to be an ankle. They're going to retape it. He's up limping around. They're going to try to go. Mike? Doc, thank you very much. 
Harris back to throw on first down. Pocket collapsing around him, and the ball is just tipped, intended for Callaway. Knocked away by T.J. Gurley, who got maybe one finger on him, but <laughs> one was enough. Yeah, McAllister still over there getting worked on, but uh, on the other defense, Gurley not quite the 6-6 size of McAllister. But this ball looked all the world like it was going to be a big game in the passing game. Of course, Treon Harris and Antonio Callaway used to hooking up. They played together at Booker T. Washington High School in Miami. So they have good timing, but that time uh, score one for uh, the Gamecocks. Ed Harris hasn't thrown one pass yet that hasn't floated. Taylor. Little cross buck action, and Taylor dragging tacklers with him to the 19. And when we talked to Doug Nussmeyer, the uh, new offensive coordinator at Florida under Jim McElwain, they were talking about with Harris, it's about not changing the playbook, but limiting some of the reads he has. Um, instead of uh, going to the back, he may just take off and run. He's got good feet. He does throw really well uh, on timing, short routes, slants, and hitches, which is exactly what you'd need here on third and three if you're going to throw it. Brandon Powell, number four, is in. He's in the slot to the left side. Gamecocks had everybody at the line of scrimmage. Harris hangs in there, throws to Powell. He has it up at the 35-36 yard line. Gain of 16. We'll go to the studio and Adnan Verk. All right, Mike, thank you very much. It's a Taco Bell studio update. Northwestern and Purdue after Warren Long scored a touchdown. Here's David Blow to Dominique Young. 68 yards. It's Young's first career receiving touchdown. We're knotted up at seven. Mike, back to you. Yeah, Dan, thanks very much. From the Big Ten back to the SEC. Columbia, South Carolina, an absolutely perfect afternoon. Temperature near 60, just a slight breeze. Harris. Whoa. Nice job, though, by Gerald Dixon. Well, oh, McAllister's just not moving very well. And th this for Florida, of course, if they went out, and that's a big if. They still have Florida State, of course, at the end of the year. Th this game, not a gimme, but they would have to win the SEC championship. But to lose a guy with his ability, they've already lost. Uh, Joey Ivey is out today. Uh, we know that uh, Bullard has the arm injury, so starting to lose some key figures on that defense would not be a good way to try to get yourself in the college football playoff. Harris has been wild so far. Jordan Scarlett comes in as the tailback. He gets a carry and gets nothing. You can understand Will Greer when he was, before he was suspended, completed nearly 66% of his passes. And this is McAllister, how he got hurt. Mm. They rolled up on his lower leg. Yeah. But you can also see why Treon Harris is only hitting 54%. He hasn't been close on some of these throws. And they've, the offensive line, which struggled last week against a good front for Vanderbilt, gave Harris no time. But so far today, this offensive line's been doing a much better job for the Gators. Taylor was wide, comes back into the backfield. Blitz coming. Taylor on the screen, nice call against the Blitz. And Taylor will have enough to midfield for first down. Terrific call. You mentioned that, Mike, by Doug Nussmeyer. When your quarterback is having a little bit of a tough time with the ball floating, you're on the road, hostile environment, and a terrifically timed job of the right guard trip Thurman getting out and good vision by Taylor. That looked like it was going to be stopped about six yards short, but Taylor made a nice cut, let the block get set up, picks up a huge first down for Florida. If you send five, it just means there's one less guy downfield to defend against that screen. And the timing becomes harder. They had to wait just a beat longer. Taylor fighting his way for two. This is a South Carolina defense that has been gashed all year. 110th in the country against the run. 208 yards. That was a sore spot for them a year ago as well. And they've had a tough time early on in watching them on film. Their defensive line getting off blocks, being able to shed. They seem to settle in. They played really well in the second half um, uh, against Tennessee last week. They played well against Texas A&M in the second half. But they have never, South Carolina has never had a lead going into halftime in their first nine games. Scarlett back in number 25. They fake it to him.
And that's out of bounds. It was caught by Demarcus Robinson, but he was out of bounds, Isaiah Johnson. And there was another pass that was just thrown up for grabs. And Robinson did his quarterback a huge favor. See him completely boxing out the secondary player, Isaiah Johnson, a good free safety transfer from Kansas. Well, that went right through his belly. Yes, but get, you know what, though? Give Robinson credit because that was an interception all the way for number 21. He slowed down and boxed him out. Yeah, that's a terrific play by Johnson to get a hand up there and knock it away. Third and long. Harris. To the sideline to his tight end Jake McGee the transfer from Virginia but they are going to mark him just shy. And decision time for the Gators. Chris yeah. Lamons. Big tackle to get the tight end and not let him go another yard. And Jim McElwain a guy who goes for it more than maybe any coach in the country and I bring this graphic up. I pulled this out of a book called Scorecasting on a study by David Romer. Now this one blows people in the SEC's mind, but there is a high school in Arkansas that never punts the ball, kicks it on sides every time after a touchdown. And what the numbers say on those downs and distances, you should be going for it. Well, no, oh, that's a... That's Lamons, the yeah. man who made the stop. Yeah. All right, we'll take up the discussion again <laughs> and check on Lamons when we come back to Columbia. That's Chris Lamons coming over to stop a guy who outweighs him by 60 pounds to keep him from first down yardage. Lamons, of course, gets the worst of it in the contact, but he does make the play, and the Gators will go for it on fourth and run, fourth and one, rather. My apologies, I said Lamons, it's Lamons. Off tackle runs are what Florida usually likes here. Scarlett did not make it. I don't think. But the mark looks favorable. David Johnson hit him. Remember, you can you can challenge the spot of the football. I thought he was short watching him live. Balls in the left arm. Ugh. I mean, if they missed this spot, they may have missed it by like an inch or two. It did look to me, Mike, when you called it and the line to make was the 40, it did look like he was short. Yeah. But that first replay, I mean, it, it would be off by maybe an inch or two. Oh. I, I, You know, you can that. challenge this. And Sean Elliott, a new interim head coach, needs to know that he can challenge it. Someone upstairs, he say, hey, we should think about challenging this. However... You give up a timeout if you don't get it, and you lose your challenge. That's the other part, and it's gone for the game. But this one right down the line, as Holloway, the middle linebacker, makes a terrific tackle. I, I mean, it, it, you, you, first of all, it has to be indisputable video evidence, which I don't think you could do. And I, I don't no. think a challenge would be smart here by Elliott because I don't think it'd be overturned, and it would cost him a timeout, but more importantly, would cost him his challenge for the rest of the game. Powell goes in motion. They fake inside. Harris with all day to throw and has Antonio Callaway wide open. Gain of 25. Well, the South Carolina defense, the struggle has been for them, and you mentioned their numbers. They're 11th in the SEC in total defense. They have not been able to generate much of a pass rush. And so far, this Florida offensive line, which didn't uh, generate much of a pass block last week against Vanderbilt, Looks like the Hogs from the Washington Redskins right now <laughs> against South Carolina. Harris has all day, and he and his former high school teammate look like in there, they're in their backyard. Uh, when you're that wide open, tough to miss a receiver downfield. Fake to Taylor. Harris again being pressured this time. Smart play. Throws it away just as mm. contact was coming. You're allowed to do that as long as you're outside the pocket. Yeah, he'd have lost a couple of yards there if he wouldn't have thrown that away. Good coverage that time by South Carolina. But this is where you could see with Will Greer at quarterback. Greer was at 65% completion percentage, more than 10 points higher than Harris. So this is the down and distance in the red zone. We're having a thrower like Greer's a help, and they haven't been able to establish a dominant run game yet because the offensive line is still coming together. So 
Not a gimme here in the red zone for Florida. This drive so far, 73 yards, more than five minutes off the clock. Taylor. They've done a nice job against the run. First man to hit him was Philip Dukes. Got him around the ankles and slowed him down until help arrived. Well, and of course, Florida has just a uh, an exciting, we'll call it, kicking game. They had the 43-yarder uh, so last week where Austin Harden, who is below 50% on the year, came in to kick it. But they had a tryout on campus. They have a backup now walk-on, who's a dental student, Neil McKennis, who tries the short field goals, apparently. But if they can get to third and inside four, don't be or fourth and inside four, don't be surprised if Florida goes for it here. Jim McElwain does not use his name. He just says, we'll go to the dentist. Harris is the pocket is collapsing over the middle, complete inside the five to Powell. That'll be enough for a first and goal, Gators. A couple of nice throws now by Harris. Seems to be settling in. He admitted he had nerves against LSU, still trying to pick up this new offense. But this was a, a, a nice throw. Again, terrific pocket for Harris. He has not had to move his feet much and finds Brandon Powell, a guy who's had some recurring foot injuries. Nice that Powell starting to be healthy for the Gators. He can be a difference maker. Cronkrite, and there is an extra R in there as the running back. He gets the carry, and Cronkrite has the touchdown. Well, his name actually has the proper number of R's. <laughs> oh, you mean one more than Walter Cronkrite. Uh, I do, and <laughs> Uncle Walter. Well, one of the freshman backs who's had to come in and help spell Kelvin Taylor. Not much depth there. So Cronkrite and Jordan Scarlett, they call them the two Jordans, the freshmen. Both of them apparently have been making good progress in practice. And Cronkrite, a guy who was suspended for the first half against Andy for a targeting block. A rare call against Georgia the week before. So nice of him to get off the schneid. Austin Harden gets the opportunity for the PAT, knocks it through. And the one loss, Gators, already in the SEC championship game, have taken the lead. Seven nothing, Florida over South Carolina here in Columbia this afternoon. Tonight on ABC, Saturday Night Football presented by Walmart has a huge Big 12 game. Undefeated number six, Baylor playing host to number 12, Oklahoma at eight Eastern as well as streaming live on Watch ESPN. Baylor leads the nation in scoring at 57.4. Oklahoma giving up only 18, so something's got to give. And if you're a true SEC fan, who are you? Quick quiz, who are you rooting for? Uh, you would be rooting for whoever is lower ranked every Oklahoma. time, wouldn't you? Yeah, with the one loss, you'd want Oklahoma to beat the unbeaten Baylor and let the Big 12 tumble around towards the finish so that, uh, say, the Florida Gators come out with one loss with a huge upset of Alabama in the SEC championship game, they would be in. See how I prognosticated that? Florida Congratulations. Alabama. Let's Let's see if Adnan Verk agrees. <laughs> Mike, I'm always in favor of Ed Cunningham prognosticating, but I want to let you know about Maryland and Michigan State. Big Ten action for you. Tyler O'Connor in for Connor Cook, who left the game. McGarrett Kings Jr., the recipient, 7 all right now on ESPN2. Mike, Ed, back to more prognosticating. Adnan, we saw Connor Cook a couple of weeks ago. He is the real deal. Yeah. And, uh, hopefully he's going to be all right. If he's not, and you, you just a exhilarating loss, if that's a thing, last week against Nebraska, but with Cook out... Things could get uh, a little easier for Ohio State and uh, Michigan to lock up the East. Jonathan Walton, the former linebacker, has been moved to offense. Number 28 is in the backfield. He'll lead block for Wilds, and Wilds will only get a yard. Kind of the new uh, regime here. Sean Elliott, the interim head coach, said immediately, I want to put my fingerprints on this team. And one of the things he did was take a linebacker who had been a really good, powerful running back in high school. He'd been demoted as the outside linebacker. Sky Moore had moved over to his spot, and they said, let's get him in some fullback. Well, they didn't just get him at fullback. The guy caught a touchdown pass last week against Tennessee, and he said the sideline erupted. It's really added nice energy to the team. Four wide receivers set, or throws incomplete. His receiver went one way, the ball went the other. Yeah, Orth immediately, he's talking to uh, 
his receiver, Patrick Belton. That's what's going to make a quarterback look very bad. when, <laughs> yeah. Because the quarterback, 90% of the time, he's correct on where he is supposed to throw the ball. When the receiver makes an out cut instead of going in, really looks ugly. Especially if there's a cornerback standing there ready to take it to the house exactly. the other way. Yeah. Third and long, Gamecocks need to do better than three and out on this possession. Orth, pump fake, now in trouble, and down he goes back at the 23-yard line. Caleb Brantley, a very talented kid, a sophomore, 6'2", 303. What a pair of tackles with he and Bullard inside. And there's Brantley going one-on-one -on, -one on left guard Mike Matulis. It's the inside hand every time. We saw that earlier with Bullard with those the hands inside the offensive linemen. That time he stuck his inside hand into the chest of Matulis and controlled him right off the snap. Brantley, a guy who when his motor's going, he's playing well. They said he can take over games. He's had a couple of really good ones this year. Antonio Callaway has to back up inside the 25 to make the fair catch a beautiful 53-yard kick by Sean Kelly. We've got a timeout on the field in beautiful Columbia, South Carolina, and we'll be back after this. Seven nothing. Let's take a look back with our Panera Bread Drive recap, which is obviously tasty. <laughs> and comes with an apple. Treon Harris getting a nice call from Doug Nussmeyer, the offensive coordinator on third and about 14. Taylor picks up the first down on a really nicely timed screen. High school teammate to high school teammate there to Callaway. And then the freshman, Cronkright, gets to finish it for Jim Malkawain, the first-year head coach who left Alabama as the offensive coordinator for three years at Colorado State. Helped build a nice program there before taking over for Will Muschamp this season. Not easy to turn a program around in three years, and he did it. Well, we, we were, we were I said, you know, to McElwain, we were talking to him, I said, it feels like you were just at Alabama. You know, you get older yes. three years. He said, yeah, but that first year at Colorado State felt like 30. <laughs> and here's a guy who spent 15 years at Eastern Washington, for those in this part of the country, just Google it. It's in Cheney, Washington. But he spent 15 years there as a player coach, uh, worked his way up as uh, the popcorn guy at the women's basketball games. He's done it all. He said, uh, we'll keep grinding here. The Gators let the first quarter clock run out. They're up 7-0 at South Carolina. Out of here. 7-0. Gators on top of the Gamecocks here in Columbia. Week 10 is upon us in the NFL. We'll have you covered tomorrow morning. NFL Insider Sunday Edition starts at 10 Eastern. Followed by Sunday NFL Countdown at 11. One of the topics that Boomer and the boys will debate is the hit on Vikings quarterback Terry Bridgewater last week, whether all quarterbacks are being treated equally in the NFL. Sunday NFL Countdown at 11 a.m. preceded by NFL Insiders, Sunday edition at 10. I know they're all paid well. I'm not <laughs> sure about treated equally. Harris takes the direct snap, throws the out, Callaway. And that seems right there. Up at the 34. You know, that seems like a simple thing, and it is. It's just a quick hitch. It's got to be thrown on time and accurately. But if Harris can continue to make those types of throws, at least you have something that's going to pick up. You know, that's a second and long. Now you get to third and short, which you can do anything offensively. Be surprised if Florida does more than run the ball here as uh, – South Carolina brings all their big bodies, fresh big bodies in, but being able to make that throw on time and accurate, accurately is a, is a really positive thing. Seems simple, but it's something you just have to have. Third and inches, Taylor. Second effort, got it for him. Let's go to the studio for an update. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Just want to update you what's happened. Ohio State taking record. on... Illinois, this is JT Barrett to Michael Thomas. Barrett's back in the saddle, and Thomas' fourth straight game with a touchdown. It's 7-0 for the Buckeyes on ABC. Mike, back to you. Adnan, thanks very much. We appreciate it. Be checking in with Adnan Verk all day for updates from around college football. A lot of good ball games on the docket. This is a big one as you look at uh, South Carolina needing a 
kind of signature win after the change of Steve Spurrier. Harris on the run drops it off to Cronkite. But if you think of the college football playoff, I went through a couple of weeks ago. They flew some colleagues uh, flew to uh, Dallas, and we went through the playoff scenario and how you vote. There is no way in the world. I don't care how ugly 12 and one is. If Jim McElwain in Florida is 12 and one, and they've won the SEC championship, they'll be in the college football playoff. Now, with that, if they get a second loss, say here today, eh, it gets a little more interesting depending on what happens to the Big 12, Pac-12. But um, they went out and they're in. Cronkite sidesteps the first defender. There's looks just, like Kelsey Griffin had him in the backfield and missed him. But there's just no way, given Florida's schedule, Tennessee, Ole Miss, they, they beat a very good Ole Miss team, uh, a tight loss to LSU, blew out Georgia, a good win against South Carolina. Remember, Florida plays Florida State at the end of the year before the uh, SEC championship game. So it doesn't have to be pretty. Florida wins out, and I think they're in. Well, last week certainly wasn't pretty. They barely beat a Vanderbilt team 9-7. First time in almost 50 years that they scored under 10 points and won a game. Great job by Harris. He just kept shedding tacklers one after the other until he got to the outside and made the first down. <laughs> it looked like he was going to be stopped about three times. Yep. And this is not something Doug Nussmeyer and, and Jim McElwain want in their offense. They're not. They do not want to be a run uh, heavy quarterback, quarterback run heavy offense, but Harris gives you that ability. And Nussmeyer kind of, when we were talking to him this week, he kind of started suggesting they may have a few more quarterback runs. They'll call. They don't like to call them. They want it to be a running back run based offense. That's what McElwain has always done. Uh, but this guy does give you a little extra wrinkle. Terrific job. They have gained more yards on the ground than South Carolina has total so far in this one. Harris on the play action. Hangs in the pocket too high for Callaway and nearly intercepted by the diving Isaiah Johnson. Yeah, Callaway, this ball hung up there. The longer throws are the challenge. Yeah, the here longer for throws yeah. are really tough for him. He has thrown underneath. He's thrown with more pace. Yeah, and these are Gamecock arms. Gamecocks don't have arms, so that's not even Gator arms. He pulls them back but you can't blame the young man you're no, going to go sir. up there and you're you know he says oh be tough go over the middle that ball's high it's going to be nearly an impossible catch anyway uh, with a guy with this much upside I don't blame 81 for pulling it down and coming back to play another day no somebody's got a chance to light him up like a yeah Christmas and, and it would have been an, a nearly impossible catch anyway that was a good choice when Harris throws deep it's exciting under a lot of pressure here throws underneath That'll be about four yards shy of a first down complete to Jake McGee, who transferred from Virginia last year, got hurt, and had to sit out. Now he is taking his quote-unquote fifth year. A little bit of pressure finally coming for Harris. Gets a nice shot from Kelsey Griffin. But Harris threw the ball on time, and now you get to a third and manageable. Remember, Florida goes for it a ton on fourth down, especially on this part of the field. And uh, so I'm not sure you need it all here. You may want to take a shot down the middle and see what happens. Kelvin Taylor is back in. Taylor. They love that little bit of eye candy in that formation <laughs> where they send Powell across the formation. And, of course, that draws the attention of the linebackers, and then they counter it by going the other way. Well, that was a down and distance where Florida really could have done anything. What an awesome read by Kelvin Taylor. That that play was defended, defended, and then it wasn't because Taylor was patient. Of course, his dad, Fred, one of the best runners ever in the game, both collegiately and in the NFL. Wasn't this guy, ever. that right there looked like his dad. Sometimes the best thing you can do as a running back is stop, and that's what he did there. So I remember his dad was bigger, about 220. Mm. And just tougher nails. Harris with time. Lobs one downfield. That's complete to Goolsby. DeAndre Goolsby, a backup tight end, makes his 15th catch of the year and gains 29. There is a flag down, however. Treon Harris sometimes looks darn good throwing the ball. There's been a couple that have floated, but this one was a screen over to Taylor, which was open, but his second read was Goolsby, and he dropped it right in there. 
I think there might have been because of the screen some of the offensive linemen downfield. Inelible receiver downfield on the offense, number 30. He was covered up by the end man on the line of scrimmage. Five-yard penalty, replay, first down. So somebody besides Goolsby made the mistake because he was going to be one of the primary receivers on this play. So here's Goolsby, and because this uh, wide receiver is on the line of scrimmage, it makes the guy on the end of the line of scrimmage like he's the offensive tackle, makes him ineligible. So what Goolsby needed to do, it looked to me like he needed to line up in the wing position instead of being on the line of scrimmage. He looked like he was kind of in between there, and you can see there knowing that that was just a li- an alignment mistake by Goolsby that just cost them a big play. Quarterback draw. Harris jukes the first two defenders. Reaches the South Carolina 36. The line to make is the 30. And Isaiah Johnson, the transfer from Kansas, who was voted one of the permanent captains in two months mm-hmm. after being on the roster made that stop and he may be he might get ready for a little more Treon Harris run game I I know that Florida does not want to be a quarterback run based offense but uh, Harris gives you so much more than you had with Will Greer and of course a little different in the past game with uh, the true runner out don't be surprised if Harris gets his number called again it's the second long drive for the Gators they scored on a 15 play drive this has already been 10 Harris under pressure this time and down he goes Gerald Dixon, number 44, hit him first and then got help. Dixon holding his right hand as he comes out of the pile. See if he's okay. Terrific coverage because the the pocket was there. The pocket was there until the very end when Gerald Dixon comes in. We've got two half-brothers, Gerald Dixon and Gerald Dixon Jr., sons of Gerald Dixon Sr., who played here for years and in the NFL. Both guys making plays so far today. And how about this? Big third down and 11. Four-man rush. Pressure. Harris gets away. Floats another one downfield and caught. Cronkrite, his second touchdown of the day. That ball hung up forever and somehow got through for the touchdown. And I think Tim McElwain just breathed a gigantic sigh of relief because that looked to like all the world that this was an interception by Chris LeMond. I mean, LeMond has it in his hands, and Cronkite continued to work back towards the ball and took it away from him. And, and this is a really good job by Treon Harris because it would have been fourth and 11. They're probably punting where they were on the field, so forcing the ball was not a bad idea by Harris there. But he's been very lucky with results. He has thrown the ball up for grabs, and at least until this point, has certainly gotten away with it. And the Gators sporting a 14-0 lead. Ever heard was every game is like a knife fight in a ditch. (laughs) And it's true. Last 30 plays in this game, 27 of them have been run by Florida. 27 out of 30. Rashad Fenton, balls loose. And South Carolina has recovered it. Later today on ESPN, a pair of games with playoff implications. 3.30 Eastern, number eight, Oklahoma State against Iowa State, presented by Cars.com. Then number nine, LSU trying to bounce back against Arkansas at 7.15. That's presented by Hilton Hotels. Both games also streaming live on Watch ESPN. I don't Big know. Big break there for Fenton yeah. as he fumbled the ball and they got it back. Yeah, it was recovered by his tight end, Kyle Markway. I was going to say, I don't know that I've seen a defensive front play as well as I did see Alabama play last week against Fournette. Perry Orth brings them out, gives to David Williams his first carry of the day. And let's check in with Jerry Punch. Mike, not a good news for the Gator faithful. Alex McAllister who came out early on. They evaluated the right knee and right ankle. Dr. Michael Moser, the orthopedic surgeon, they retaped the right ankle. He tried to walk, couldn't put a lot of weight, took him to the locker room. He has just come back out here uh, with a boot on that right lower leg on crutches. 
done for the day. All right, Doc, thanks so much. South Carolina now has to be getting a little desperate to get something going on offense. Fourth with the deep out, nice grab at the sideline. Well, Farrow Cooper, who came into this ball game with 48 catches. That's number, well, he was averaging 72.9 yards a game as well, at number three in the SEC. And they try to move him all over the field. They've got him lined up in the slot now. Makes it harder to jam him. Blitz coming off the corner. Float it in the flat to Brandon Wilds. And Wilds makes a man miss. Across the 35 to the 37-yard line. Nice run by Brandon Wilds. 16-yard catch and run play for the Gamecocks. Well, the blitz came. And it was picked up inside. The running back that slides over there is David Williams, and it was a really nice, accurate throw. Keanu Neal, who had a foot injury, comes over to make the hit on Wilds. Doesn't make the tackle, but Neal, Gator fans not uh, sure he was going to be able to play with a foot injury. But that was a, a nice throw by Orth. It was on time and accurate, allowing Wilds to outrun Antonio Morrison, who was in coverage from the middle linebacker spot. Last throw was intended for Hurd. There's Neal. Yeah, they were... Florida was thinking they may be out without two starters. Bullard, who's awfully good in the middle, and Neal, who's the most physical presence in their secondary. Good that they have both those guys back. Cooper takes the direct snap. Nothing there as the Gators were ready for it. Well, first down has just been disastrous for South Carolina. They have averaged well under one yard per first down, and you can't be that far behind the sticks. The term... Behind the sticks means you get the second and third down. Instead of third and three, it's third and eight because you've burned that first down. On first down, six plays, minus two yards for South Carolina today. Orth won another screen. This is a tight end screen to Jarrell Adams. And Keanu Neal came up to make the tackle. Well, I think with the secondary that Florida has, maybe the best in the country. Ohio State's is awfully good. Clemson is awfully good. We've seen them. But this may be the best secondary. Right now, G.A. Mangus, the offensive coordinator who's promoted full-time once Steve Spurrier stepped down, but playing it awfully conservative, going with a tight end screen on third and 11. But I think a lot of that is just feeling like they, the way Florida's playing, we may throw an interception. Sean Kelly, terrible kick. That's a great bounce, however. That thing was never more than four feet off the ground. Would you like to change your adjective? <laughs> no, it was a terrible kick. Effective. It was a great bounce. 45-yard kick and no return. Florida ball when we come back. ESPN College Football, brought to you by Cadillac. And Dr. Pepper and College Football. It's a one-of-a-kind tradition. The Riverbank Zoo and Garden right here in Columbia opened 41 years ago, twice been awarded the Governor's Cup for South Carolina's most outstanding tourist attraction. I was once told, do not pet the giraffes. I asked why, and I was told they don't like it. <laughs> Boy, that zoo takes a lot of pride in their zoo, don't they? Oh, please. Gators start from their 15. Taylor. Gets two and no more. Hasn't really been able to pop many this year. As the offensive line matures a bit and they start to get a little more recruiting angled towards getting big guys up front on offense and defense at Florida, it'll get better. But they really want to just keep attacking your edge. We were talking to Jim McElwain. Spent a year at Fresno State under Pat Hill as the offensive coordinator. He talked about how Pat Hill taught him so much about the run game, but a lot of it was just about an attitude, making it really the foundation of your program. So they won't go away from it. Four-man rush, which hasn't generated a lot of pressure, but Harris takes off. Didn't stay in the pocket very long that time. Gets out to the 20. It will bring up a third and five. And the one thing the South Carolina defense would love to do is get off the field. Haven't been able to stop much. 
so far and the way that their offenses have played especially on first down starting to get a little tuckered I would think with 420 left here in the first half that's a lot of ball these guys have played in black jerseys on kind of a warm day crowd trying to get into it good turnout here hasn't been a home game in the stadium because of the flooding since late September five men comes nobody gets there pass batted down underneath Rico McWilliams played that very very well he wasn't going to let anything short happen and McWilliams was up the entire time that's press coverage on DeMarco Robinson excuse me DeMarcus Robinson who ran a decent route didn't get much off the sticks you'd want to maybe have him push McWilliams a little farther beyond before coming back but McWilliams been pressed the whole way was uh, all over the Gator receiver Cooper is deep Florida has had terrific cover teams all year long nice punt Cooper has to chase it all the way back to the 22 got a block on the corner got another block and that's going to be a block in the back two flags down on that one the first one was legal the second one looked iffy and as it turned out it was worse than iffy and what the officials are looking at that's Belton who's a wide receiver Matrick Belton but what the officials are taught to look at for blocking the back is where does the defensive player land if he lands on his chest or stomach it's blocking the back if he lands on his side or his back it's blocking the front they're discussing this among themselves illegal block in the back number 15 during the return penalty is 10 yards first down so the first block you saw right by the punt returner the guy landed on his side this one not so much very clearly number 26 Marcel Harris lands right on his tummy that's penalty welcome back to college football on ESPN we've got a 14 nothing Florida lead it's presented by cars.com our Affleck trivia question today, Kelvin Taylor tied for the most rushing touchdowns, nine in SEC games by a Florida running back since 1997. With whom is he tied? I'll have a guess here in a moment. Are they as good as your other guesses? <laughs> <laughs> or, or are we getting better? I think I've gotten zero this year. Well, then That's you'd it. have to get better. And Ooh. Orth will just get rid of that before he's buried back at the just, five. You cannot have zero or less yards on first down against no. a defense like this. this. You can say all you want about Will Muschamp and what he did and didn't do at Florida. What he did was he built a pretty good defense. And these coaches from uh, Florida have been very vocal about the type of guy that was left behind, their work ethic, and Jeff Collins, the defensive coordinator, I think did a really smart thing. He learned their language. He learned Florida's language, Muschamp's language, so that these young men could learn faster and go faster through spring and summer, and boy, has it paid off. Pass underthrown, intercepted. Picked off by Jalen Tabor. His third pick of the season and the only one that hasn't been returned for a touchdown. He just stepped right in front of the receiver, and Orth threw it to him. Well, Hargraves leads the team on the other side with four INTs, so Tabor's trying to make it a competition. But this ball, Tabor just never moved. He sat on his spot, sat on his spot, and when Orth finally came back over to that side looking for Hayden Hurst, it was too late. And uh, unfortunately for South Carolina, their slow starts never having led a game this season. They were The best they had was tied against Texas A&M at half, once again looking like they're going to limp into halftime down if not 14 maybe more and the Gators have lived off of their defense and turnovers plus 10 for the year going for more from behind the sack back of the 27 yard line as Harris never saw the defensive end coming and now if you're Sean Elliott the interim head coach at South Carolina with three timeouts here not right now but finally getting some pressure, just blitzing four. They have not been able to do that. 
But uh, at some point, Sean Elliott may want to consider starting to use some of those timeouts. You're down two scores. Every possession is going to count in the second half. Your, your offense has not played well. You may want to start thinking if Florida's going to slow play it here and looking to kick a field goal, although they're not good at that. So clearly they're thinking to get in the end zone. And the Gators having a tough time lining up. They're going to have to burn the timeout to make sure they have the right formation. Gators in control here at South Carolina. And Taylor tied for the ah, most black. rushing touchdowns, Can nine of them in SEC <laughs> case by a Florida running back since 1990. Come on, I've got this one. Fred Taylor. <laughs> Look at that. Hey, I'm one for ten. No, you're not. You're 0 for 10 because you already we already gave you the answer during the commercial. What's interesting about this, somebody gave you the answer last night at the production and meeting forgot. and you forgot it. So you're this should count as two losses. You're Fred, 0 for 11. Fred with a terrific career. Yes, of course, he, went on to the Jacksonville Jaguars great. and helped build that franchise into a near championship group with a quarterback named Mark Brunell from the University of Washington. Love to get a Brunell plug in there. Former teammate. Second and 19. Complete inside the five to DeAndre Goolsby. Another pass that floated, but somehow they get there. Goolsby, a guy who they've been challenging some in the in the run game to block a little better, but he is a special talent in the throw game. What a terrific catch. And that time. He didn't have the mental error of being lined up improperly, so that time he was an eligible receiver. And all of a sudden, this game just starting to get away from the Gamecocks. Don't, don't go into shell shock here, though. You're down right now two scores, maybe three, but maybe start to think about getting some time back. If Florida's going to burn a little bit of clock here, you may want to try to save some for your offense. Cronkrite is in as the tailback. He's already scored both touchdowns. Going for his third here, but won't even get to the five. Harris has completed 11 of 19 for 164 yards. They haven't exactly been lasers. He, the short and intermediate stuff, he throws very well. He's got good balance in the pocket. The offensive line has played much better today than they did last week against Vanderbilt. So starting to find an offense. And, the and, thing I like about him, he'll hang in that pocket mm -hmm. for a long time, even when it starts to collapse, looking for a receiver. Harris on a little half roll, still looking, and makes the smart decision and throws it away. And remember, for Florida, this is a place where Jim McElwain will almost certainly go for it on fourth down. He did last week against Vanderbilt. They were 0 for 3 last week on fourth down because of the kicking woes, but it's something that he's done going all the way back to his Colorado State days. So this is a, a down where you could think about some type of run potentially. Austin Harden, number 16, is their normal kicker. Neil McGinnis, who they call the dentist, is the short kicker. It's a pre-dental student that they found in a campus tryout a couple weeks ago. Harris in trouble. Survives, then throws the pick. Intercepted by T.J. Gurley, who was standing at the right on the goal line, and Harris hit him in the chest. Well, this was not the result you wanted. You had a chance to go up three possessions if you're Florida. And Gurley, who had a wonderful play earlier in the game where he knocked away a ball that was intended for the corner, and this ball just forced by Harris. If anything, throw that thing away and see what happens on fourth down. If that's, if that's fourth down, I understand forcing it, but you obviously don't want to force it on third. But now for South Carolina, the question is down to a minute with three timeouts there in the shadow of their own goalpost and not been able to generate any kind of run game. Maybe Florida could think about using some of their timeouts to get the ball back. And that Florida defensive line is really firing through there as well as the linebacker, Jared Davis, number 40. Now let's check in with Ed Enverk. 
All right, coming up on the Alexis Halftime Report, Mike will be talking about the fact JT Barrett is back for Ohio State. Trevon Boykin right now for TCU banged up a little bit. An update on his condition as they're facing a huge underdog in Kansas. And also Dalvin Cook making history for Florida State. That's coming up in the half. Back to you guys. Yeah, Dan, thanks. We'll look forward to it. Perry Orth. Well, they're doing a smart job because Florida, I think, is going to use their timeouts after this down. And this is a good job by South Carolina to eat some of this clock. I'd be shocked if Florida doesn't take a timeout here. Why not make South Carolina punt the ball if you can? Wild yeah. got out to the five clock still running. I'm surprised that Jim McElwain wouldn't use those timeouts and at least for South Carolina to punt. What's the worst that can happen? You could get a block. Yeah, you could get you know some type of big play in the kicking game. That seems like leaving those two out there uh, would have been a help. At the half, our score, Florida 14, South Carolina nothing. Now we send you back to Adnan Vert for the Lexus Halftime Report. Welcome back to College Football on ESPN, presented by Cars.com. Gators 14-0 after a one-half of play here at Williams Price Stadium in Columbia, South Carolina. And after you watch the first half, I'm really not sure how to rate either one of these teams so far. <laughs> well, but there's one way to rate them, 14-0 for Florida, right? Uh, True. It didn't look like they got much going, but they, they have enough tools on offense to manufacture some stuff against a kind of a struggling South Carolina defense. So we'll take a look at the AT&T strong performance and even though it wasn't a beautiful performance by Treon Harris, the quarterback for Florida, it has he led has the tailback. to he's a two touchdown, touchdown lead. Here as he's reading to his right, he sees one, it's not there, he takes off. That's what the coaches are trying to get him to do now using him a bit more in the run game here on a quarterback draw. They had one earlier in the game on a third down to pick up a first down. And then with the play fake, because now he's getting involved in the run game, and he's able to hit his former high school teammate Callaway for a big gain down the field. And then, of course, he gets helped out by Jordan Cronkrite, the freshman receiver who comes back and takes the ball away from a South Carolina defender. So while it's not been pretty, it's still a 14-0 lead for the Gators. And, of course, he had the big pick at the goal line late in the half that could have put them up three scores. Yeah, it's like the game last week against Vanderbilt. It wasn't pretty, but you know what it did? Yes. It clinched the SEC East. So the not pretty Gators continue. Rashad Fenton is deep. The first time he touched a ball in a college game, he went 96 yards for a touchdown. Won't get a shot at this one. And here's Jerry Punch. Mike spoke with Sean Elliott coming out of the locker room at halftime, South Carolina interim head coach, and asking him about the offense. He said, you know, we've been a second-half team the last couple of weeks, but we've got to make better decisions with the football, do a little bit better job blocking up front. He said, and defensively, we've got to get some pressure on the quarterback. We've got to get some hands and some helmets in Harris's face. We have got to pressure the Gator quarterback here in the second half. Yeah, I'd be really surprised if we don't see a lot more blitzes by John Hoke, the co-defensive coordinator in his first year with Lorenzo Ward. Elliott last week told uh, Hoke to pull the reins off in the second half against Tennessee, and they got a lot more pressure. So far, not much pressure up front. Childs, the running back, he'll get the carry. Picks only a couple of yards up on that run against a very stout Florida defense. And the best thing they do on defense is prevent people from scoring. They are fourth in the country in that department, allowing only 14 six points a game. You can hang your hat on 14-6. Um, with John Bullard able to play today, that's a very good player, Caleb Brantley, but that uh, he's got his line mate next to him, and Bullard, it's a big deal for Florida. Guy wasn't expected to play. Pressure on Orth, and they got him. Brian Cox, Jr. His dad, the Falcons defensive line coach, a brilliant player in his own right in the NFL. Working over the right tackle, the old arm swing move over Mason Zandy 
And, of course, uh, we purported earlier in the game, Alex McAllister out with what, what looks like a right foot or ankle injury. So back shoulder throw intended for Hayden Hurst, but he's out of bounds. Hurst just starting his football career has an unbelievable upside with his size and with his speed. But another bad start for South Carolina and another ball thrown out of bounds by Perry Orth. He's got to, if you're going to work the sidelines with the taller Hayden Hurst, that's something that Sean Elliott said they wanted Hurst more involved, but you got to keep that ball in play. Kelly, the transfer from Florida Atlantic, will punt to the dangerous Callaway. Signals fair catch and makes it back to 33. Every college football Saturday, put one game on the big screen, another game on your computer, tablet, or smartphone. Use Watch ESPN. Just download the app or go to watchespn.com. Isn't it gorgeous here today? The fans would be happier, of course, with a little offense to get them back in this game, but this is just spectacular. My first trip here to uh, williams Bryce Stadium, for whatever reason, just was never assigned a game here. It's a neat place. Nice, isn't it? Yeah. Feels cozy for 80-plus thousand Yes, people. it does. Treon Harris in the pistol gives to Taylor. They've done a good job bottling up Taylor, the spur linebacker, T.J. Gurley, with another tackle. Only 34 yards on 11 carries for Kelvin Taylor. That's 3.1 a pop. He averages 3.7 on the year, and Ed, as you pointed out earlier, has not been able to break many long ones this year. If there is a rebuild process at Florida, it is on this side of the ball, quite obviously. Harris out in the flat to his big tight end, McGee. His third catch has a first down. Rico McWilliams takes him out of bounds. McGee would be a nice addition to get going later in the year yes, as they would. get going. 6'6 six, six guy. We actually saw him a few years ago help beat Penn State at Virginia. He was very good uh, down around the goal line, and we've already seen some of the struggles at the red, in the red zone because of the lack of the really good inside run game and not the accuracy of Will Greer at quarterback anymore. So getting a guy like uh, McGee involved, especially near the end zone, could be key. They have thrown to their tight ends quite a bit. I think a lot of that because they're smaller, they're shorter throws. This ball is tipped and intercepted. Picked off by Gerald Dixon. As that ball bounced from player to player, Harris was hit from the blind side, lost the ball, and maybe that's the break the South Carolina team needs. Markavius Lewis hit him from behind and caused a fumble. Yeah, you mentioned Lewis being one of the top junior college recruits coming in. And that ball bounced off of number 92, Gerald Dixon Jr., into the arms of his half-brother, <laughs> just the plain old Gerald Dixon. <laughs> Both sons of former great Gerald Dixon Sr. from here in South Carolina. So it goes from the junior college transfer Dixon to Dixon and a big turnover for uh, USC. They can bring in Cooper to take the direct snap. Or the quarterback goes to a slot. Cooper can throw, has three touchdown passes in his career, but he'll run this one. And Cooper will pick up seven. That's about the first time on first down they've done anything. Well, and you, you can see why G.A. Mangus, the offensive play caller, of course, took over full time when Steve Spurrier line stepped aside. On the Florida sideline. That is their first warning. Too many guys on the white stripe for Florida for the officials to work the field. But uh, you can see why G.A. Mangus brings Farrow Cooper into the backfield. I, I believe that is the longest play that they've had on first down during the game, five yards. Little swing to Cooper, perfectly diagnosed and stopped. Incomplete, Brian Poole, the nickelback, read it from the get-go and was there just as the ball got there. Poole was working, Hayden Hurst, the former pitcher we've been talking about. He was the guy meant to block Poole, and Poole, uh, well, he ran by the fastball there.
They need to reach the 33. This may be four down territory at this point. Pump fake by Orth, and then he's buried. But Bullard, who was questionable coming in, just kept pushing the pocket. Just impossible, I think, for an interim head coach right here to make the choice to go for it on fourth and long. But on the plus side of the field, this is unbelievably just a, a you know, Bullard as a bull rusher, just getting his hands inside. You, it's so hard to give help to an inside lineman. That was Will Sport being pushed back. But I think this is the right call here. I do, too. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you've only had one snap on the plus side of the field. And I, I, I think that I, I was going to say that as an interim head coach, you've got nothing to lose. Why not go for it? But sometimes you go towards the more conservative. But I like the idea of South Carolina going for it here. They have to use the timeout, however. We'll be back after this. ESPN. And tonight on ABC, Saturday Night Football presented by Walmart has a huge Big 12 matchup. Undefeated number six, Baylor, against number 12, Oklahoma, 8 Eastern, as well as streaming live on Watch ESPN. The Bears have won the last two against the Sooners and three of the last four. Playoff implications abound. And we'll be talking about playoffs a little more in just a minute here. After burning the timeout, they have decided to punt after all from the 44-yard line. Hargraves is inside the 10. Signals fair catch makes it at the 8. 36-yard kick and no return. Time now to look at the college football playoff rankings brought to you by Northwestern Mutual. What about this week's lineup? Well, if, you, if you're a Florida fan, you're saying, how do we get there? Well, you just hold tight because look at Alabama sitting there at number two. They go through and get to the SEC championship game, and you went out. You beat them. Remember, the college football committee literally goes week by week. They don't look ahead. Well, at the end of the season, if they look at Florida and they would have beaten, say, a number two Alabama team in the SEC championship game, again, I mentioned earlier, I just don't see a scenario where a one-loss Florida is not in the playoff. Now, are they good enough to be in there? I don't know, but they would have won enough to, to be considered, and I think be in. Scarlett, the running back, crosses the 10, then pushed back. And I think for for Jim McElwain to be in this position is just astonishing. You know, we've seen Clemson, and uh, I, they're the best team I've seen this year. Me too. Uh, we've seen Michigan State. We've seen Ohio State twice. Um, if I were to have to pick between Ohio State and Clemson, I think they'd beat Florida by 10 or 14, but they haven't been beat by that. They have played in a tough league. They have one seven-point loss to LSU, and we'll have some incredibly you know, big quality wins. They hand it off to Brandon Powell. Sky Moore, the leading tackler for this club, may have gotten a face mask. Personal foul, face mask, number 10 on the defense. 15-yard penalty, first down. Would have been third and two, mm. but it's an automatic first down. And as Moore went out to make the tackle, just couldn't quite. Sure did. Uh, let go of the face mask of Powell. Powell, a guy that they're starting to get involved more and more ways, just trying to manufacture some offense. Uh, you know, it's easy to say that Florida with this offense wouldn't be able to compete in that uh, four-man playoff or four-team playoffs, but the truth is they play great defense, and they're starting to find some things that can, ha uh, can work offensively. Moore, who committed that penalty, leading South Carolina for the third straight year in tackles. That hasn't been done here in over 20 years. He's a terrific performer at the weak side linebacker. Harris, plenty of room. He wants to keep it. And we check in with Adnan Verk. All right, thank you very much, Mike. At the half, we showed you Dalvin Cook a little banged up, but he's back for Florida State, and they need him. They're down by 10 against NC State, but Cook to the rescue, at least here for the touchdown. So making things a little closer right now in Tallahassee. Florida State down by three. Mike, back to you. All right, Adnan, thanks very much. And Florida State, of course, will play Florida, one of their remaining games on the 28th. Go back to the swamp for two in a row before the SEC championship game. Taylor picks his way 
near the 40. They'll need about two yards for the now, first down. Now things get interesting, though. What if Florida were to lose to Florida State, who has one of, I think, the best running back in the country in Dalvin, Dalvin Cook. Cook? So if you lose to them, you go with two losses in the SEC championship game, then you knock off Alabama. You've got two losses. I don't Florida. know. Two losses. I yeah. don't know if you can make no, it. I don't think they get in at that point. But uh, out of conference game with Florida State, of course, South Carolina knows that feeling. They have Clemson at the end of the season every year. Both uh, schools honoring their in-state rivalry, even though they are out of conference. That would rankle a few feathers in the Southeastern Conference, wouldn't it? Yes. Five-man rush. They don't get there. The pass underneath complete to Demarcus Robinson. Still on his feet to midfield. He's got the first down. I mean, it would literally be unheard of for the SEC champion, widely considered, and I think just so justifiably is the best conference in, in college football, for that champion not to go to the Final Four, even if they were 3-8 and eight if they won the conference championship game. Well... But we've been in the Big Ten. We've been in the Pac-12. I will say the parity, especially along the line of scrimmage, the size and ability of the athlete, especially on defense, I think it has started to catch up and, and get equal in places like the Big Ten to the SEC. Underneath and complete, even that, without a gun, Harris has been able to find a lot of guys underneath. You know, that was really uh, over the last decade of dominance for the SEC. What the difference was when you came here and you watched this game was how big and powerful and athletic their defensive linemen and their offensive linemen were. And you saw that in sprinkles in other leagues, other teams. But now we went and saw Indiana a couple times this year. They're big and powerful. Ohio State is as good on their defensive line as I've seen in a long time. So the rest of the country is starting, I think, to match the SEC at that important position. Taylor, but I will say this. After watching LSU and Alabama last week, <laughs> Alabama is still a step above anybody else. The guys they have at 350 are faster than the guys you have or two or 290. Give this guy a little while, though. Remember, Jim McElwain comes directly from, well, not directly. He went from Alabama as the offense coordinator to Colorado State, but he knows the blueprint. He's a terrific recruiter, has a great personality. The players love him. He the guy makes sandwiches and soup in his office for his players just so he can have normal conversations, just so guys will come hang, hang out. He's done a really terrific job getting buy-in from the entire team. Taylor splits out a little bit, comes back to throw a block, and they go to the tight end. Jake McGee shakes one tackler, makes his fourth catch, and picks up another first down. We had a nice chat with Jim McElwain about his background. Of course, he started as a player and a coach at Eastern Washington, and he talked about Dick Zorns. And during that time, I was at the University of Washington playing, and Dick Zorns and all of his staff, including Jim McElwain, would go visit Don James and the program right. that they ran at Washington, who began that term process. Then he went to work for Pat Hill, who taught him the run game, and then Nick Saban came full circle, former assistant under Don James, who really influenced how he runs a program. Pressure coming, and another smart decision by Harris to just get rid of the ball. And that full circle for Jim McElwain back to work for Nick Saban, and all the influence he had when he was getting to visit with Don James at Washington, he said, you, you learn what's called the 18-month calendar for your program, where over an 18-month period, every single day, is structured in what you're doing about the team, about recruiting, about nutrition, about training, everything that touches the game. And I think Alabama, of course, is really the, 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 the gold standard across college football how to do that. And now Florida has a guy who understands that blueprint and I think has the wherewithal to pull it off. Second and 10, Powell drilled as he got to the line of scrimmage. Dante Sawyer nailed it, and it will be third and long. What Florida, you can say everything they're not on offense. You know what they've been today? Time Ball killers. Ball hogs, yes. They are not playing fair. As we tell our two young kids, you have to share the ball. Well, Florida's not sharing today. They're not they, sharing the clock. They did not learn their lesson well in kindergarten. Remember, field goal's a big adventure here. So to go up three scores here, not a gimme here if you're Florida because of the struggles in the field goal game. Quarterback draw, Harris. He'll be stopped short, and a decision for 
Jim McElwain. Do you go to one of the struggling kickers? There's the dentist. Well, I, I, you know, here's the disaster on a field goal is if it gets blocked in return. So uh, a little surprise as Harden comes out. He's a guy who's had some struggles. He's four out of eight. He kicked a game winner a week ago, which was a 43-yard field goal. He had missed three straight. This will be from 39. They held a 216-person tryout camp. And he just gets this inside the post. Good by Harden. Neil McGinnis, a dental student, won that tryout. He got one kick, a missed PAT, and it was back to Harden. ESPN College Football, brought to you by Taco Bell's new Steak Boss Wraps. And DirecTV. Call 1-800-DIRECTV. The South Carolina Military Museum right here in Columbia, one of the largest National Guard museums in the country. That helicopter, the first one of its kind to come off the line in 1948. Steve Spurrier may be gone at South Carolina, but he is hardly forgotten. Still dominates the exterior of Williams Bryce Stadium and yesterday they were updating his resume on the outside of the building. Well, his resume includes the winningest coach in the history of South Carolina and Florida, a national championship at the University of Florida along with his Heisman Trophy as a player and his most impressive feat, ACC champions in 1989 as the head coach of Duke University. I think that one is the one yeah. that is actually the most sterling. And number two in SEC wins to only Paul Bear Bryant. That's a remarkable career. Let's take a look at winning traditions driven by Goodyear. In 1990, South Carolina was in the middle of a down period, so local real estate developer Ed Robinson came up with a plan. He purchased 22 cabooses, which he turned into game day party trains called cockabooses. His attitude was not a better team than a better tailgate environment. Now, a cockaboose, which could have been purchased for $25,000 then, the asking price is now a cool $299. And you can't even sleep in it. I bet that rule has been broken. <laughs> That's my guess. Desperate times for South Carolina here, down by three scores. Orth is flushed. On the run, throws it away. There was contact downfield, and a late flag comes. Hayden Hurst, the baseball player, was being trailed by Nick Washington. I don't think there was any way he was ever going to catch that pass, but it also looked like interference. And the officials, the back judge and the side judge on that side, you can see them talking because clearly there was contact, at least in the lower body, between Nick Washington and Hurst. But I think Hurst at 6'6 may have been able to get a fingertip on it. I, I think they're probably talking about whether it was catchable or not. I think it, it, uh, it was. There are two fouls on the play. Pass interference on the defense. Personal foul, number 70 on the offense. Penalties all set. Replay, first down. So they did call the interference. My take on this has always been it doesn't matter if it's overthrown. Pass interference is pass interference. Still, and then if, not is called for Yeah, a foul. but if, if the ball is thrown, you know, 15 or 20 yards over the head, they wouldn't call that. But that, it's in the range. It's in the range, so you call it. But then they get the personal foul on center Allen Knott. So something that would have gotten them across midfield or at midfield back to first and 10. The running game has not been there for Brandon Wilds. Yeah, I'm not sure how much more you're going to be able to run with uh, down three scores uh, with 428 ticking away in the third quarter. I'm not sure how many more times you can have one yard runs to Wilds. Taven Bryan made that last stop for the Gators defense. What a great story Bryan is. He's a kid from Casper, Wyoming. After the play was over, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 70 on the offense, number 54 on the defense. Those penalties offset. 
That is the first unsportsmanlike conduct for number 70 and number 54. And Alan and, Knott is on a roll. Yeah, and Alan Knott is r- lucky that he didn't get called for a personal foul the last time because if you get two personal fouls, you would be ejected. Check on the right side of the screen. Obviously not. Well, he was getting a little scrappy there with uh, Jared Davis, but uh, for not very lucky that the first penalty he got was not. Okay. That's his teammate, Mike Matulis, yeah. so he's not guilty of the second one. Yeah, it didn't, Alan Knott didn't look like he was doing much there to get a personal foul, so I'm glad that they changed that. But here for South Carolina, <laughs> I mean, to say this has been a tough day offensively, .5 yards per rush. Admittedly, this is a great Florida defensive unit. Mike, just so you know, that's a foot and a half. If you're I'll, doing the I'll get it on the way home. <laughs> I get out pencil and paper. Hmm. And it just went down. Jordan Sherrod, who was hit for targeting last week and missed the first half, gets in on that stop. Now it's third and very long. And this Gator defense today has only given up three yards on the ground Mm. and a scant 41 through the air. 43 total yards is a serious defensive number. And this is an offense for South Carolina that was up to 432 yards per game. They've gone up almost 80 yards since uh, this staff took over offensively, and there's a a drop. Adams should have had that Mm. ball. Orth hit him in stride, and he couldn't hold on. Adams hoping for a big game this week. He had a Critical fumble against Tennessee a week ago. And now they'll have to kick it away. Well, and unfortunately for South Carolina, sitting on three wins, they needed to go 3-0 down the stretch to become one of the 80 teams to go to bowl games this year. You heard that number, right? 80. That's a lot of teams. Yeah, and uh, without a win today, doesn't look like South Carolina. You- Beautiful <laughs> kick. Kelly with a rugby-style kick just killed it 69 yards but the Gators continue to dominate with that great defense and they are up 17 nothing thank you very much we have a 17 nothing score here in Columbia and the Gators and Treon Harris their quarterback have the ball back of their own 20 Cronkrite, the running back with the extra R in his name, is out there to start this series, and he will get the carry. Picks up about five. You really have to give a lot of credit. I mean, to to win the SEC East in their first season, staff's first season, Jim McElwain had the battle cry, restore the order. Of course, Florida was dominant in the SEC East for so many years under Steve Spurrier and Urban Meyer. So they have restored the order, but to do it with this offensive line, this is a group that coming back from last year, there were nine total starts. That means that that of all the guys coming back, they had only started to combine nine games coming into the season. So to manufacture an offensive line, they've played so much better today than they did last week. Pass overthrown intended for Callaway. And uh, this is with David Sharp, the left tackle, battling battling a leg injury. They weren't sure if he was going to even be able to go. But they have really established a nice pocket all day. Last week against Vanderbilt, there were times in the second half where Harris wasn't even hitting his last step before he was taken off running. And today, even though the pass game hasn't been explosive, at least they've given him a nice pocket to work from. And would you agree that right now their best offensive lineman is the freshman left guard, Martez Ivey? He's a guy that they was super highly recruited and uh, of ultimately may play some tackle, but to get their best five on, they've slotted him in there at left guard, and he is growing. Here's that counter action, and it's Cronkrite, and he's got a first down. Boy, I'm not sure who took the worst hit here as Cronkrite to toss up. Ended up following, but uh, it's the guys in black you're trying to uh, run through. 
boy, that's dangerous as all that get out. That was Demarcus, Demarcus Robinson. Robinson, and Robinson's head was down, and then he flew all the way back. That was obviously not on purpose by Cronkite, but that's awfully dangerous to hit uh, your star receiver that hard. That was incoming. The way this game has gone, Florida has been able to control the ball, long drives, one after the other, and South Carolina, the last five times they've had the ball, they have not generated a first down in those five drives. 13 total offensive plays for South Carolina in their last five possessions. That math doesn't quite work out. Doubled the time of possession, and only 44 yards given up by the Florida defense. They have been spectacularly good. (laughs) <laughs> McIlwain is making Nick Saban proud. Yes, he is. Harris hit from behind, completed it to Jake McGee just as he was hit. McGee's fifth catch, Sky Moore, was attacking the quarterback, Treon Harris. And he, Harris got sandwiched. He delivers a strike, but he gets nailed right as he's throwing this ball and goes into the legs of his offensive lineman. Very lucky as Sky Moore drives him into the ground, but uh, Harris a little slow to get up. And we mentioned with Will Greer suspended, you'd go all the way down to a graduate transfer, Josh Grady, who's played very little quarterback uh, at Vanderbilt, mostly played wide receiver. So you're going way down the depth chart if you lose this guy. We should see him. He has had one pass and two runs all year long. Floated again, but right into the hands of Callaway. And Callaway so fluid. They say he may be the freshman wide receiver in the history of Gator football. And if he is, he's mm. an unbelievable player. Yeah, of course. Uh, Jack O.S. Green and Percy Harvin. and Had a few. Callaway, yeah, he's going to end up with the true freshman receiving record here at Florida. Former high school teammates in Miami at Booker T. Washington. Of course, Treon was one year ahead of Callaway. Callaway, a true freshman this year. Harris, a true freshman who started six games last year at the end of the Will Muschamp era, went four and two. So they were able to get Callaway to uh, stick to uh, a commitment to come play with his ex-teammate. Florida's going to let the clock run out on the third quarter. Gators on cruise control right now. They're up 17-0 against South Carolina. And there is a penalty marker down. They haven't blown the whistle to end the third quarter yet. Play clock had plenty of time left on it. False start on the offensive line. Penalty is five yards. Please reset the game clock to two seconds. Well, that was so odd because the backs were already walking toward the sideline. Mm. Yeah, the center looked like he maybe picked up the ball and dropped it. So that is really a technical Mm. penalty, isn't it? (laughs) Okay. We still don't have to snap it if we're Florida. And Jim McElwain is trying to say there wasn't even a play. And they still haven't blown the whistle. Thank you. The third quarter mercifully has come to an end. 17-0 Gators. We'll be back in a moment. On ESPN. And welcome back to Williams Bryce Stadium in Columbia, South Carolina. A game that has been dominated by Florida, particularly on defense. They have just shut down South Carolina, both in the air and on the ground. First and 15 for the Gators from the 46. Taylor. Taylor down the sideline. Bumped out of bounds to 23. I was going to say they missed a hold, but.
but they no. did throw a flag. I think they yeah. got it. Martez Ivy, that true freshman we were talking about, I believe, working on. Was it Cox? One of the Gerald Dixons. I believe he was working on Gerald Dixon. I mean, somebody was held big time. Holding number 73 on the offense. Penalty is 10 yards. Replay, first down. So left guard, you watch big 73 pull around, and as he goes to block there on Gerald Dixon, yep, got him right by the collar there. Good call by the officials. No reason to hold there. He'll learn that. Guy was already bounced outside. Wasn't his block that set him free. So first and 20 for Treon Harris. You know, a game that's felt totally in control with a full quarter left. You're only up three scores. Turnover, quick score by South Carolina. They're right back into this. First and 25, and Taylor was to carry down to the 40. Got 16 of them back. Except that it feels like Florida's not going to let that happen. No. <laughs> I mean, this is you – know, we saw Iowa last week, and everyone wants to talk about what Iowa doesn't have. They're, they're a really good team. And if they went out, I would not be surprised at all. Florida – the smoke and mirrors that they're doing on offense to talk to, if you are a Florida fan to know what they had coming back on the offensive line know that they really didn't have their quarterback settled Greer started playing well but the the things that they've been able to manufacture as coach and staff been awfully impressive Harris quarterback draw week 10 Monday night 8 15 Eastern on ESPN Andy Dalton and the undefeated Cincinnati Bengals will face JJ Watt and the Texans coverage starts Monday night countdown at 6 on ESPN as well as streaming live on watch ESPN and if you go back to last season it was the game against South Carolina South Carolina blocked a punt with 46 seconds left to get the ball go down and score put it into overtime ultimately win and Will Muschamp was fired the very next day and a lot of people think if South Carolina had not blocked that punt while Florida was up seven that Muschamp may still be the uh, head coach including Will Muschamp. Harris be about a yard and a half shy and this is no man's land here it's easy to go for it at this point and Jim McElwain's already made his decision. And we had put this up earlier for discussion only. This is something I pulled out of a wonderful book called Scorecasting. And this is hard for people to think about, but it says fourth and five, you should always go for it. Of course, that would never happen, especially in the SEC. But fourth and eight or less inside the 45 and fourth and 11 or less inside the 33. And this is something that Jim McElwain has done since his time as head coach at Colorado State. And here they are in fourth and short going for it again. A little toss and they won't make it as Jordan Scarlett had his legs cut out from under him by Bryson Allen Williams who diagnosed the play beautifully. Well this is Treon Harris. He has to see that there's bad numbers to that side. Allen Williams had nobody assigned to him even though they had all of the strength including Brian Cox Jr. to that side. It's Allen Williams who outnumbers the Gators. Fourth quarter, Gamecocks trail 17. Zip had a chance to visit with Gamecock Athletic Director Ray Tanner, who knows about coaching. He won back-to-back -back national championships in baseball. And I asked him to discuss with me when you're going to make the coaching decision and who makes the choice. And I'll tell you after the play, Michael, we'll just, I'll tell you what he had to say. All right, Jerry, look forward to that. I know your connections with Ray Tanner, and he was a brilliant coach. Have a baseball coach be named the athletic director of a uh, major school. I can only think of one other guy that was Skip Bertman at LSU. Doc, back to you. Ray said he has an advisory committee that will advise him as to who the candidates are. He said, but by the fact that I asked Sean Elliott to be the interim head coach, he automatically becomes a candidate. And I love his energy and excitement. But as far as when they make the decision, just a moment. Nice move by Hurst. 6'3". Two or six five, two hundred and fifty two pounds. He runs a four five forty. And of course, we were, I, I would say, captivated by the personality of Sean Elliott. There's his wife, Summer, where she's hopeful as well. And coaching, when somebody like Steve Spurrier leaves in the middle of the year, all the coaching staff wonders what is going to happen to them. 
you know, their futures are up in the air, but I think that's probably one of the reasons that Steve left when he did. He said this program needed a new voice, and Sean Elliott turns out to be the guy, and he has an infectious personality. The players seem to love him. And there's uh, Steve Spurrier Jr. He's wearing, uh, I'm sure, the honorary visor in <laughs> honor of his father. He's on the staff as a wide receiver coach. But if you go back to – it's nice to hear that Coach Tanner, as they call him around here, because even though he was the athletic director, he was a coach for so long, is going to give Sean Elliott a, a real look. I, this guy has changed uh, the attitude around here. Practice has gotten more physical. They've gotten more competitive at the line of scrimmage. He was a former all-conference defensive end at Appalachian State. He brings that mentality. But uh, – this is fourth and a yard, by the way, to try to keep this drive alive. And they're fading hopes alive as well. Oh, there you go. A freebie. Brantley got across early, it appeared. But Elliott was brought here by Steve Spurrier five years ago. Offside on the defense, number 57. Five-yard penalty results in a first down. Doc, finish up your thoughts on Ray Tanner. Yeah, he said we got to make a decision early in December. It's important to get that decision made. Obviously, they had 100-plus recruits here today, and they want to know who the head coach is going to be. So it's imperative that that committee and his advisors get it done early in December. Of course, a game like this does not help his cause unless they can mount a comeback in the fourth quarter against one of the nation's best defenses. Williams will get the first down, then fumbled the ball. Still loose, and it looks like South Carolina had a shot at it at the end and may have come up with it. Mason Zandy dove on the ball and saved the day. Well, finally, South Carolina gets a little offense going. They get an offsides by Brantley. Not sure the knees weren't down. They will not review this because South Carolina recovered it, so no knees, in, no reason to review it, but I'm not sure that his knees weren't down. Orth sets, throws, caught and loose. I think that's going to be ruled incomplete, and it is. Through the hands of Farrow mm. Cooper, their most reliable receiver. Good throw that time by yes, Orth. Yes, it was. Cooper, such a good player, but they said he has been dealing with some drops recently he never tucked that ball away terrific job by Jalen Tabor to not quit on the play but as soon as you catch it you see the guys work put that thing right up in their arm Cooper kept the ball out allowing Tabor to come in and knock it away good finish of the play by 31 they put Cooper in the slot left this time give it to Wilds if you go back to that fumble for a second that was recovered by Zandy he is 6'9", 314 pounds. He's a right tackle. They discovered him at a quarterback camp. And Sean Elliott saw him and said, son, next week we have an offensive lineman camp. I want you to come back because I think you can play the <laughs> offensive line. You're not going to play quarterback. And unfortunately, the 6'9", Zandy gets up favoring what looks like his right lower leg. He's a junior from Chapin. And that's a, a true freshman now comes in at right tackle, number 63, Blake Camper. So you go from a junior to a true freshman in the SEC when you're down three scores. Tough duty. Flanker screen. Cooper wants to throw. Throw back to the quarterback. Orth has it. Touchdown. The fourth career touchdown pass for Farrell Cooper, and he laid it out there for Orth. Now the officials talking about a flag in the end zone could be excessive celebration. Because it was well after the play was over. I can see why the cork would pop on celebration for <laughs> yes. South Carolina. That's a heck of a throw by Cooper. Nice catch by Orth, too. I know. And a defender I, closing <laughs> on him. Had the defensive end, Sherritt, who had let him go, was turning yes. in all 6-5. It was a touchdown. After the play was over, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 10, 
on the offense. That 15 yard penalty will be assessed on the kickoff. Greeted with a chorus of boos. You know, at some point you have to decide. Kids are going to be kids. Let them celebrate a little bit. Well, we and sometimes it's what's said, not what we can see. If there's mouthing to other players that use foul language, they'll throw that every time. And officials say, please don't judge us by what you see. A lot of times it's what we hear that has us pull the flag out, and unless we have a microphone nearby. But we would be muting that anyway now, wouldn't we? Yes, we would. Cooper on a flanker pass, a perfect strike to the quarterback, Perry Orth. ESPN College Football is presented by Cars.com. All drive, no drama. At Pauly's Front Porch here in Columbia, if you eat three eight-ounce beef patties, you get your name on a night that hangs on the wall like that guy. And I will tell you, if Ed Cunningham was there, there could be knives everywhere. <laughs> you could take that yeah. and then order dinner. I, I was a 300-pound lineman at one time in my life. <laughs> but we're going to go back and show you that penalty on Perry Orth. A big 15-yard penalty now for South Carolina. This could give good field position to Florida as they're trying to milk the clock. Powell. And normally their kickoffs go out of the end zone. This is a call for a celebration, and I'm sorry, it is a terrible call. Yeah, the Perry only, Orth doesn't do anything. The only thing he does is a little spin of the ball as he goes down. But if you watch this angle, as he's celebrating, it's, uh, I mean, to call that for the spin of the ball seems awfully ticky-tack. Now, the rule, they are the, the officials are pushed and pushed and pushed to try to stop celebration, planned celebration. That one didn't look planned to me. Yeah, he spun the ball a little bit, but that's an awfully big 15-yard penalty for a guy getting up celebrating and spinning the ball, what, three-quarters of a turn? Well, they call them judgment calls, and in that case, I think it was terrible judgment. Harris under pressure, and down he goes. Well, a little sacked shocked. by Kelsey Griffin. A little shocked Florida's calling a drop back pass. Uh, you know, the it, it, the momentum all of a sudden may have felt like a change, but you're still up two scores playing against a team that hasn't been able to do anything offensively except the last drive where they had to score on a reverse pass to their quarterback. And now good pressure. That Sky Moore coming from the outside and uh, a good finish of the play by Kelsey Griffin, but just wondering why Florida would be even risking a drop back pass here. I mean, this is clock time. You want to be eating this. And, and Calvin Taylor was starting to find some room on that last drive. Taylor will get it this time. No room there. And they're just selling out on defense. They are fired up after that score. This is a team in South Carolina that played very poorly at the start of Tennessee last week and had a chance to win it at the end. They were going down to score, and it was a fumble by their tight end, Jarrell Adams. And here you go with John Hoke, the co-defense coordinator, starting to feel it a little bit, getting some energy from the building. And that first down drop back pass, still a head scratcher for Florida. Kelsey Griffin was coming off the field, relieved on third down. One of his teammates chest bumped him, nearly flattened him in the process. Third and long. Harris to throw underneath to Callaway. Antonio Callaway trying to get to the outside, taken out of bounds. And this will bring up fourth and long. So all of a sudden, old Mo is going mm. the way of South Carolina. I, I, you know, I don't want to beat it up too much. They called a drop back pass on that first down, and you know they probably felt like, oh, we're going to catch them off guard. There's no right. way they're going to think it. Well, you end up with a sack and a big negative yardage play, and we've seen how tough it's been for South Carolina all day with negative yardage plays on first down, and so now we're turning the, uh, the favor a bit. Townsend will kick to Cooper. He's back at his 30. Still a lot of time to go, 7.02. Nice punt. Cooper driven back to the 20. Looking for a block, can't find one. 
after all that, gets a yard after a 50-yard punt. Nice coverage by Chris Thompson, a backup wide receiver. Friendly reminder, coming up next, you know, in 2011, Oklahoma State 10-0, ranked number two in the AP poll, then fell to Iowa State in Ames. They'll try to avoid that predicament, and that game coming up here on ESPN. Over on ABC and ESPN2, Deshaun Watson, number one Clemson, getting set to take on the Syracuse Orange. As Mike Patrick says, though, every SEC game like a knife fight in a ditch. Back to him and Ed. It's the truth. This one is living up to the hype, celebrating its 11th year sponsoring the Good Hands Field Goal Nets. Allstate makes contributions to participating universities' general scholarship funds for each field goal and extra point kick. To date, Allstate has contributed millions in scholarship funds. Can South Carolina mount another drive? Well, yes, they can. A perfect strike to Matrick Belton for 26. And a walk-on who has played in every game. And now for South Carolina going fast, down 10. They they have a good field goal kicker. We've been talking about the struggles for Florida, but Elliott Fry, typically money, especially inside 40 yards. I don't Trying know how to much. get something on the ground, but Brandon yeah. Wilds can't get anything because John yeah. Bullard is there. I just don't know how much you want to be running the ball. There's Fry there who inside of 40 this year, he's 11 for 12. Outside of 40, he's uh, not doing so hot. Five for 11. So you want to get down inside the 25-yard line, and then you don't want to burn too much clock down 10 because you'll take the three and then try the onside kick. Four-man rush, time. Great catch near the 40. Terrific throw as well. That's Jarrell Adams, the tight end. Very good coverage, and Orr fits this right in there. Adams, who had the fumble last week in the fourth quarter as South Carolina was going down inside the 20 to try to win. Well, Wilds again. I think you want to tear this page out yeah. of the playbook. Yeah, and it's can, just not working. Man, you, can hear, you can hear the South Carolina fans grumbling a little bit. This is the offense has changed. It has become much more of a run option based run game with play action off of it. So you're not doing as much drop back passing as you did under Steve Spurrier. However, I'm not so sure the run game is part of the plan right now. Wouldn't this be a comeback for the cause of interim coach Sean Elliott? This is a free play if they let it go. Oh. And then Orth is belted out of bounds. And a flag is down. This may be 15 for a late hit. No, I don't. I, I think that that flag is from the offsides. I'm not sure that that was a late hit, Mike. Orth was, it looked, I mean, it was a big hit. Well, that's where they threw it. Yeah. That's why I thought it was. Yeah. But the coaches, when Orth ran to the side, they were pointing downfield. They Offside knew. On the defense, number 96. Five-yard penalty. Replay, second down. They that's knew. a free play. Yeah. Go ahead and throw yeah. it. And Orth. Orth deciding to run it, but the coaches on that side, on the South Carolina sideline, yeah, that's just a, I mean, it's it's close right there, but that was a heck of a job by Jared Davis to get over there in a hurry. But uh, the coaches, everyone was pointing to Orth, just heave it. You've got a freebie. Take a shot. And he yeah, didn't. nothing bad can happen. Orth again with time. Cooper, touchdown. A 38-yard strike. Who flipped the switch? Ed Cunningham. Sean Elliott has said this is a second-half team all year. Not sure why they take so long to get going. But Farrell Cooper runs right by Brian Poole and the safety Marcus May. You cannot. In this situation, have your safety standing flat-footed, not against a guy like Cooper. And now, because they scored so quickly, I think South Carolina can kick the ball off and not have to do an onside kick. Orth was 5 out of 13 until this streak. He's 6 out of his last 7. There's a touchdown pass and a touchdown catch. They have awakened in Columbia. It's a three-point game, and later today on ESPN, a pair of games that have major playoff implications. 
3.30 Eastern, number eight, Oklahoma State battles Iowa State, presented by Cars.com. Then number nine, LSU, trying to bounce back against a red-hot Arkansas team, presented by Hilton Hotels. Both games also streaming live on Watch ESPN. South Carolina has stunned the Florida defense that had been airtight mm. for three and a half quarters. This they game have burned them. I would say about 5 to 10% of this stadium left thinking this game was over. And the momentum that South Carolina has gotten all started, it uh, sometimes does, on fourth down, Bryson Allen Williams, the outside linebacker, sparks in, gets a great stop on Jordan Scarlett, and then Farrow Cooper throws his fourth touchdown passes of his career, a strike to Perry Orth, and then Perry Orth pays him back and puts a lap, a throw right into the lap of Farrow Cooper as he ran by the inexplicably flat-footed safety from Florida, and all of a sudden, the building getting noisy, and Sean Elliott, who kept talking about as the interim head coach, this is the second half team. Well, they're believing it now. And they are losing their minds in the stands and on the South Carolina sideline. A yard may be two for Cronkite. And as hard as it is for Florida right now, this is where I think on second or third down, as much as it makes you tingle to think about a throw because an incomplete pass stops the clock. South Carolina is going to have as many people at the line of scrimmage as possible while covering everyone else one-on-one, -on -one, knowing that the only way Florida gets out of here alive is if they can run and pick up a first down. Those fourth quarter numbers are amazing. What a turnaround. Do you dare throw the ball with Harris? pressure coming they don't get there and Harris over the middle and what a catch by Robinson that ball was right on the tips of the grass and he went down to get it for 19. What a terrific as as, as you know that first down call where they threw it on the drive before we were questioning that but on this one this is a great call you you know that South Carolina has everyone up around the line of scrimmage You've got one-on-one -on -one coverage with one very deep safety for South Carolina and a good call by uh, head by coordinator Doug Nussmeyer and a good throw by Harris. Low and inside, only his guy could get to it. Terrific execution. Taylor fought for a couple. Remember, they only have two timeouts left because of the one they blew earlier in the ballgame. Let's check in with Adnan. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Just want to update you what's happening with regards to Florida State as Sean McGuire here to Kermit Whitfield. NC State was leading early, but the Seminoles have come right back. 27-yard touchdown there. Currently 27-17, Mike. Boy, talk about open. Jeez. Looked like Farrell Cooper. Yes, he did. Not quite able to burn out the clock if you're Florida. One more first down should do it. Pressure coming. Harris under pressure, throws incomplete. Taylor was in the area, but if you pressure a quarterback, you can make him throw bad balls. The other thing this does, it stops, stops the, the clock. clock. They don't have to use a timeout. Yeah, I think the rollout here, I think the thinking is, and remember for Harris, he has only played in 10 ball games in his career. Now that's great defense, but I think the thought was rolling him out that he could run the ball and take a slide and not burn it. But now, if they're not, if uh, Florida's not able to pick up this third, third down, I'd be surprised if they throw it here. Quarterback draw may be the call, but uh, South Carolina is going to be able to get a timeout and get a lot of time on the clock. The ball back. Safe call. They give it straight off to Taylor and Taylor. First down and more. Taylor up the middle. To the goal line. They sold out, but somebody left the middle of the field wide open, and Taylor roared through it for 53. Holy cow, what a huge play. You run it, you run it, you run it, you run it. Remember in the first half, what did he average? About two yards a carry? Yep. Then you get to the fourth quarter, and this offensive line, this much maligned offensive line for Florida, sticking it out, sticking it out. They finally get a seam, 
And now crazily, Florida can't quite run out the clock right now by taking knees, so they will have to run some offense. Taylor. Touchdown, Gators. You would have never guessed it. For all the world, South Carolina had the momentum back. They were forcing a third and long. You knew it was going to be a conservative <laughs> yeah. play one way or another. And it was an ultra-conservative play. It was but, a straight handoff. But, I, you know, go back to the throw that they did on second down where Harris hit Robinson. Uh, that's a gutsy call. Great yes. execution. I, I said it felt like they were going to have to throw one on that second or third down. You did not want to give the ball back to South Carolina because it felt like they were going to go down and score and win it. So hats off to Florida and their offensive staff in trusting in Treon Harris. This place went from as raucous as you could get to stunned disbelief. An unbelievable turn of events here in Columbia as the Gators have regained their 10-point advantage. 24 to 14 tonight ESPN is Washington State number 19 UCLA 10:45 Eastern is the start when that finishes Sports Center at night directly follows all the highlights busy day also in college football the NBA and the NHL that Sports Center at night after the Cougars and the Bruins on ESPN and streaming live on Watch ESPN well you guy like Kevin Kelvin Taylor they've been trying to pop him out and pop him out Jim McElwain, who comes from a long lineage of coaches who like to run the ball. Keep sticking to it, sticking to it, and then all of a sudden you pop one down to the one to get the win. Check in with Adnan. Mike, just want to let you know that Rex Ryan is in the house. He wants to support Clemson. Of course, his son plays for the team. He's a walk-on receiver. Sammy Watkins also there. Clemson Syracuse coming up on ABC and ESPN2. Mike? Thank you, Adnan. Does anybody get more airtime than Rex Ryan? Nope. Son, oh. the reason Rex would be at Clemson, his son is the holder. Yes. On kickoff and, or excuse me, field goal and PAT. The fans the are streaming out of here after that stunning run. And this is going to be incomplete. Brandon Wilds out of the backfield dropped it. And of course, talk at South Carolina turns to with the resignation of Steve Spurrier earlier this season. We had a time to sit down with Sean Elliott yesterday. I really hope they give this guy a long look. Me too. I mean, they were getting run out of the building here yep. for a while. The guys hung in. They put together some offense. There, He's out with his assistants doing a terrific job keeping the recruiting fires burning during this time. And I hope that they give him a good look, and and you know I took some time to think through who some of the guys uh, they should look at, and of course a lot of people talking about Tom Herman at Houston and the who terrific. doesn't want Tom Herman? Well, you know it's three quarters of a season as a head coach. I agree he's a a smart guy offensively, of course. Fourth under pressure, but, scrambles. But here are the when as I was looking at kind of the people for this job. I think Tom Herman fits. Jim Tressel, who is, I know a lot of people are saying, wait, Jim Tressel, but his show cause to coach comes up this year, and I think he'd be have a ton of energy if he wanted it, and I think Sean Elliott is a guy they should give a long, hard look at. If he had completed that comeback today, and there is a flag down at the end of this play, they might have gone down to the field and signed him after the game. Yeah. And uh, they gave it a valiant effort. They really did. And yesterday when we talked to him, he said, you know, I played at Appalachian State, and then I worked under Jerry Moore, one of the greatest coaches in college football history. They won three national championships there. And his brother, who was a graduate of South Carolina, saw that the offensive line job was open here, and he texted him and said, hey, you know, that job's open. He didn't, never thought that anyone would give a FCS-level offensive line coach a job except one guy, Pass and that was Steve Spurrier. On the defense, number seven, 15-yard penalty, first down. And Steve Spurrier did because the offensive line was struggling. He needed help, and they brought Sean Elliott here. And you talked to all of the players. When he was named the interim head coach, 
They loved it. They always liked how positive he was with his offensive line, the energy he brought to the practice field. He seems like a guy that has a plan, and I know with Steve Spurrier gone, part of the reason Steve Spurrier stepped away in the middle of the season, I think, was give this coaching staff a chance. Yeah. If, if Coach Spurrier would have left before or at the end of last season, you would already have a whole new staff here. So I think for Coach Spurrier, uh, waiting until this season, maybe thinking he still had it in him, is uh, potentially allowing this staff to stay intact. Picked off Quincy Wilson. Stepped in front of that throw and made the grab to pick off Perry Orth and end the threat with one minute and 20 seconds left to go. This Florida defense is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty salty, aren't they? You know, when we were talking to uh, Jim McElwain and his staff uh, this week before the game, they were talking about, yeah, you know, we, we had to go around and find some people in offense. We had to find an offensive tackle. We had to sign two freshman running backs. But the defense was pretty well set. And, and Will Muschamp, give, give him a lot of credit. When, when uh, uh, Urban Meyer left, this place was, uh, was shaky. And, and Urban admits that. There was an article in Sporting News about how bad things had gotten in the locker room. Will Muschamp cleaned it up a bit. Yeah, he didn't get it going on offense, but he sure got it going on defense. And here you are with a championship team. And, yeah, it's Jim McElwain as head coach, but you have to give some credit to Will Muschamp because they're winning with this sure. defense. The, the cupboard was not bare. No. No. He had recruited some guys. Uh, and he was a defensive coach, yeah. is a defensive coach. So his emphasis in recruiting was on defense. You can understand that as McElwain's will be on offense. If you coach on that side of the ball, that's your yeah. your, your expertise. That's what you're going for. It was great visiting with uh, Coach McElwain. He spent that one year at Fresno State with Pat Hill. And anybody who remembers the amazing job that Pat Hill did at Fresno State, he said, you know, he just showed me the importance of having a power run game. It makes the defense play differently. And you saw that at the end, that last run. Now, Florida State certainly uh, on November 28th, it's not going to be a walkover. No. Florida State is very young, but they're going to have to, uh, and they're taking a look at Fred Taylor shaking up after that last play. But Florida State certainly capable of taking a great mm. shot at Florida and everything the Gators have to offer. You, back to your point earlier, if they lost that game and were a two-loss team going into the championship and somehow beat the Western representative, would that be enough to get in the top four? I don't know that a two-loss team has a shot. I don't think it would. We'll see what shakes out in the Pac-12. If, if Stanford were to lose a second time and win the championship, maybe. But I think uh, the, the hard part for Florida would be then it would come down to, wait a minute, let's look at how good they really are and what they don't have on offense, and you'd start to nitpick. With one loss and a win against Florida State at the end and a win against likely Alabama, they're, they're a shoe. They'll be in. I, I, I'm not saying... I, what I've seen is not a top four type of performance, but it, it's it's the outcome on the field that the the committee will look at above everything else, and it will be impressive outcomes if Florida can run the table. Well, there's some guys we wanted to mention today too, like Steve Spurrier, one of our favorite people. It's just been a delight to be around forever. Gary Pinkle is stepping down, the Missouri head coach, because of a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, you have a connection with yeah. Pinkle. I, I got to meet him for the first time last year. Really liked him. Yeah, sad news uh, when Coach Pinkle stepped down. He was our offensive coordinator, played at Washington under Gary before he left to be the Toledo, Toledo head coach and just uh, the Missouri all-time wins leader. And when Missouri came into the SEC, there is nobody on the planet, especially down here in the southeast, that felt like the Tigers were going to be able to compete at no. all in this league. And in the first two years, all they did was win the SEC East two years in a row. And so for a moment, I'd like to take some time to uh, thank Gary Pinkle for what he's done. He uh, really looked out for his players. Of course, Michael Sam, who yes. came out as gay a couple of seasons ago, and no one knew about it until the end of the season. And then, of course, in the last couple of weeks, backing some players who were part of the protests on campus that right. led to the resignation of the president of Missouri, and Gary Pinkle had their back the whole way. Pinkle, a guy who uh, really transformed uh, some coaching in that Missouri area and built a program at Missouri that no one thought was possible. Well, we wanted to wish him the best. 
and also to Frank Beamer at Virginia Tech, mm-hmm. who did everything with such grace and class throughout his exceptional career, took a program that was absolutely nowhere, and one of the reasons he was able to build that program into the power that it is was the level of patience that they had. Mm-hmm. He had a full six years to build that program to where it was a consistent winner. Today, nobody gets six years. Well, imagine if uh, the Florida Gators don't win the SEC East next year. What happens to Jim McElwain? Well, exactly. And, and that's the thing. As a Gator fan, you really do have to keep this in context. This is one of those magical seasons where things have come together. Uh, but this has really been done, especially on offense, with bailing wire and, and uh, some twine. People's expectations in this day and age are just off the charts. Clock stops with three seconds to go. And the Gators will have wrapped up another victory. They really earned it in the fourth quarter, though, after playing great for three quarters. They were burned for two touchdowns. But now we'll go to nine and one. Seven and one in the SEC, and who could have imagined nine and one this year? <laughs> Not the Florida faithful. They had such a terrific run, of course, under Steve Spurrier, and then Urban Meyer wins two national championships there. And lo and behold, first year for Jim McElwain and his staff, and and here we go with the. Lateral Ruski. <laughs> and Antonio Morrison was having none of it. And the Gators win at 24-14. For South Carolina fans, wasn't much to, to cheer about until the fourth quarter started. And then there was a lot, but that exceptional comeback fell just short. What a quality win for Florida. They came in here, they had a bunch of guys banged up on their defensive line. John Bullard, maybe their best player, came in. He was injured. He played and played well early. Nice win. Let's go to Jerry Punch, Doc. Well, Coach, for over three quarters, your football team controlled the clock, the football, and the scoreboard. And then what happened? Here comes South Carolina with two quick touchdowns. Well, let's give them credit. Man, they, they hung in there. They've been playing hard all you know ever since all season. And obviously, these last games, they've been right down to the wire. So... You know, we knew we were going to get this kind of game, but let's not look at the point that, you know, we won the game, and, and our guys figured out a way to do it. Last week you were concerned about your offense. Only nine points had to come late for the field goal to beat Bandy. Today, 24 points. Where do you see the growth in that unit? Well, obviously we can't turn the ball over, and we gave up some points down in the red area that, you know what, we'll learn from. We've got some guys playing their tails off, and we're a good football team, and we'll get a little bit better next week. You talk about next week, but beyond that, you got Florida State, maybe a date with Alabama. How soon do you begin thinking about those games? Well, it's obviously it's out there, right? But at the same time, what we've done a pretty darn good job of all year is figure out if we win the now, we got a chance to win tomorrow. And that's what we're going to do going into this week. We've got a team coming in that's full of a bunch of Florida guys that wishes they were Gators. So they're going to play the hardest that they've ever played. So we've got our attention on FAU. Hey, Coach, congratulations. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. There's a coach who had a brilliant year at Colorado State, having another brilliant one of the different schools. He's led the Gators to nine wins. Once again, our final score, Florida 24, South Carolina 14. For Ed Cunningham and Dr. Jerry Punch and our entire crew, this is Mike Patrick. Thanks for watching. Now we go to Adnan Verk and the college football scoreboard presented by Honda.